Okay, so I'm going to pass it to Brian first to introduce the lecture as a whole. Sure. Thank you, Lindsay. Appreciate it. Um, speaking to you, to, to, to you today from Washington, D.C., where it's nice and cool and sunny today. Uh, usually at this, the, uh, this lecture, we, it's kind of a reunion. We usually get uh, Craig and Mimi Spangler, who are the donors for this particular lecture, to come down along with their, their children and we celebrate the, uh, their gift to the school uh, and we celebrate the lecturer. And we had planned on doing that last spring. Uh, we were going to host Pascal for the lecture at that point, uh, but something got in the way. Um, so we went into lockdown and didn't get a chance to do that. So just to give you a background, um, several years ago, Craig Spangler, who's a 1982 graduate of the School of Architecture, uh, at the University of Maryland, and his wife Mimi were considering ways to make a meaningful and lasting contribution to Craig's alma mater. And they hit upon the idea of creating an endowed lecture series that would spotlight, spotlight particularly emerging talent in architecture. Uh, that meant that uh, we wouldn't be inviting for this particular lecture folks like Zaha or Judy Gang or Deborah Burke or people like that, we'd have other venues to invite those folks. Well, Zaha, not, not possible now. Uh, but the idea was, however, that we would focus on individuals who someday might actually assume these kinds of roles. Uh, and they would be the sort of awesome next generation of, of young architects. And so we want to thank Craig and his family. Craig, I noticed, uh, uh, was kind of scanning around before, is with us today from his office at Ballinger in Philadelphia. I want to thank you, uh, uh, you and Mimi, for your great generosity to the school. And uh, I think it's really proof that even under the conditions we're living under today, that life goes on and we're able to bring this lecture to students. We're going to do it again in the spring because uh, we'll have uh, two kind of back-to-back -back opportunities uh, to present the Spangler Lecture. The interesting thing about the Spangler Lecture is because it features young talent, one of the things that we did early on was to ask students to be involved in the choice of the lecturer. So Pascal, you are the student's choice this year, and there have been some really great ones in the past, and we're very happy to have you with us. Turn it back to Lindsay. All right, thanks, Brian. So just a reminder for people that have joined in the last few minutes, the Zoom conversation is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please unmute. Um, so the lecture today is a part of our fall programming. The broader charge is under construction. Um, and the charge is to consider areas of our discipline that need attention, reconceiving, and reconstruction. This semester, we're trying to reify architecture through the lenses of how, why, for whom, and by whom. So we can understand the people, process, and politics behind the final image or the final render. The story that we don't get access to, uh, maybe as much as we should. And in doing so, we aim to illuminate the ideas and narratives that will yield a world that is more inclusive, just, and considered. Uh, we have a great series of events, um, including the lecture today. Um, on October 28th, we have um, figure Jennifer Lee and James Lang. Um, and then on November 4th, we have um, Fariz Giga. So two more um, public lectures um, and all the recordings are available on the MAP Architecture website. So you can find um, the recordings there in the future. So with that, I'm going to um, hand it off to Pascal. You can share your screen, if I can stop sharing my screen. Um, and please take it away. Thanks for being here. We're really excited. Well, first, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I'm excited to share my story, my journey, and this call for advocacy and citizen architecture kind of positions on how we're considering both the profession and how we impact the built environment. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Don't mind all the tabs. No judging, please. Um, make this full screen. So how are we doing? Can everybody see my screen okay? Looks great. Perfect. All right, awesome. Okay, so, so a little bit about me really quickly. Um, 
Pascal Sablon. I'm a mom of a four-year-old. I'm a senior associate at S9 Architecture. I am the NOMA National Historian. I am also NOMA National's Northeast Regional Vice President. I'm also AIA New York Board of Director and AIA National Strategic Planning Committee uh, person. Plus, I am on Board of Trustees for the Mary Lewis Academy. Now I share those different titles with you all to kind of just give you a sense of that I try to be as involved with organizations as much as possible for me to be able to set policy and uh, be strategic about implementing changes that are long lasting beyond moments, but really uh, be put forth throughout. These organizations also create amazing opportunities to volunteer and to get involved. So I've been able to uh, volunteer with um, AIA, with the K through 12 programs, ACE Mentoring, and NOMA's uh, project pipeline. And in those kind of programmings, we really connect with the young kids of those communities and talk to them about architecture and start to give them that idea that architecture is a profession that they can uh, pursue and see how that impacts their, their life in the built environment. And through those days, or sometimes a multi-day camp, we walk around their neighborhood, they get to look at buildings, and then they start thinking about what project they would want to bring to change their community. And at the end of the day, they're so excited. Their parents are excited. We're excited. Excitement all around. Um, I wave as these kids leave and I wonder, well, what happens when they try to research us or try to get more information? Essentially, what happens when you Google the word great architects? So I did just that. So I typed in the word great architects and Google banner comes up with the first 50 names and faces. And on your screen here are four rows of 10. So the first 40. And as you can see, this list is of contemporary architects all the way down to Raphael and Michelangelo. So in this list, how many do you think are women? One, Zaha. So we're saying from now to when architects were Ninja Turtles, there has been only one woman who's done significant work to the built environment. Okay, how many do you think are African American? Zero. But we have nine minorities. Za is clutch. She holds it down in two different categories here. Um, and again, it's this issue of, is that true? Are we to say if a little girl with curly hair who looked like me came and experienced Project Pipeline or K through 12, if they researched architects, are, are they being told that really they don't have the capacity based off of what you know, comes up as great? So here are 40 amazing African-American architects. This is a wonderful print screen moment. Um, I highly recommend that you get familiar with them, see their work, see their contributions to the built environment, to the profession. Um, and that's, that's really important. But I did also have a conversation with Google. I went to their headquarters, which is conveniently here in New York City. Um, and I said, why is it, this comes up when I type this in. And they said, Pascal, honestly, there's just not enough content out there that call you all great. So one fun fact about this presentation, this visual kind of uh, way of reading it, is when I'm setting up the issue that I'm trying to explain, the sheets are black and white for the most part. Um, and for the pages that I specifically have done something to try to address that issue, those sheets are yellow. And then for the, the initiatives and such that I want to do and continue to aspire to achieve, those pages are cyan, my favorite color. So I just wanted to kind of show and help kind of visually communicate with you while we're speaking also. Um, and also kind of giving the other lesson, which is um, you don't always have to present from a position of done. You can also present from a position of aspiring to do because you never know who's in the audience and who can support you in that mission. So coming back from uh, the conversation with Google and uh, witnessing uh, Dr. Adelaide Sanford's in Afrocentric education as a human rights speech. She talked a lot about um, Albert Shanker. Now Albert Shanker is a person that's highly regarded. He really, um, he was the president of the Federation of Teachers from 1964 to 1997. He really in his capacity controlled our public school system across the nation. And he did a lot of great things for teachers and teachers unions and schools. But one of his methods of making education equitable uh, was about purging culture, right? And so he had this mindset that you never let the African-American child learn of his or her history, 
because if they do, they relate more to their ethnicity and they will not become an American. And I started to think about what were the women and the people of color that I was taught about architecture in schools. And I realized that was limited, if not non-existent, right? And then the other idea of teach teaching the teachers not to keep that history. So also reflecting on when was I ever really educated about how to document, how to keep track, how to keep record, and the importance of doing that work. So what did I try to do? Well, the first thing is we did our first Say It Loud New York exhibition in January of 2017. Uh, the concept for this exhibition is to see our faces, hear our voices, feel our impact within the colorful tapestry of our heritage. So to see our faces, I created huge headshots that went with the, the labels for each project. So you saw what we look like, not just our names. Um, hear our voices. I created these video testimonials on either side of the gallery so you can hear their experiences answering the questions about what encouraged them to join the profession and what has been their experience been. And then feel our impact is really through the projects and through the work, which is what we want you to really know us from anyway, but really showcasing that. And I wanted to be vibrant and bright and loud and really um, just be colorful and be unapologetic about that heritage that is displaying. Funny enough, somebody from the UN actually came to the exhibition at the Center for Architecture and invited us to do another Say It Loud United Nations in the New York campus in March of 2018. Now they had much more strict guidelines about graphics and colors and such, but we still got to say it loud um, and uh, was really proud for that moment and that achievement. And then they offered me the power of the podium and gave me an opportunity to give a speech at the opening of the exhibition. So I said, hey, world leaders, you understand that representation matters. I need you to help me make this a national movement. And before I got to my seat, somebody at the UN said, we're gonna help you make this an international movement. Uh, also in that year was the AIA conference, uh, A18, happening in New York, uh, ironically at the Jacob Javits Center, one block away from my office, S9 Architecture. And I had submitted a few seminar panel discussions and the exhibition uh, for consideration, and they were all declined and basically said, your topics are too bespoke to one community and they want more inclusive, overarching, reaching uh, topics, which makes sense, I get it. Um, but I took that no and I wanted to squeeze out of it a yes. And that's what I did. The first thing is I talked to um, my family here at S9 and asked, hey, can I commandeer our main conference room for two days or so and take over our gallery for about a week? They said, absolutely, whatever you need. I called the United Nations and said, hey, y'all, are you done with those boards? Because I'd love to display it around my office and create a backdrop to these lectures. And they said, absolutely. And then I coordinated with um, all these other diversity inclusion groups and committees that I had been a part of and asked them to spread the word. And we organized our own seminars and they were attended by hundreds of people, which was crazy and a constant flow of people coming to see the exhibition. So even though it started off as a no, I ultimately got a yes out of it, which was super dope. Um, and United Nations was true to their word. Um, Man, we worked over the course of a year, we worked with about a few translators and translated the exhibition into eight different languages. And March 25th, 2019 was Say It Loud Day, where United Nations information centers worldwide had the exhibition up and actually put a call specifically to professors and students to come to their centers to see about the amazing work and be able to read it because it's translated into their languages. So in the center of your screen there, as you're seeing all the different ways you say, say it loud in those languages. Um, I cannot express to you the amount of tears of joy that came out of my face on this day when I received these photos. Um, but it also um, taught me something. At this moment, I had been elevating the same 22 people that we had featured in Say It Loud New York. And I thought, no, if this is the kind of reach I can have, I need to make this more of a traveling activation rather than a traveling exhibition. So um, I also started branching out beyond kind of Center for Architecture and thought South by Southwest would be a really great position or place to have another exhibition where it's an audience of people who appreciate design, um, but are not necessarily architects. And when we created this very small compact 
exhibition space, I wanted to make sure that people really took the time to see uh, the work and assess the work. So I created a people's choice kind of uh, competition within the exhibition. So people would look and I said, okay, so now vote for your favorite. And they're like, whoa, I got to vote. And they would go back and they would read everything and carefully come back and type in and select their answers on my iPad. Now, what that did was A, it helped me codify and kind of quantify how many people visited my exhibition. Um, and so even though I had a thousand people actually physically come to the exhibition, because I made this digital online kind of gallery of the exhibition, I actually had 6,000 votes. So um, it also starts to rush change to me and understand that it's not just about the physical experience, but that there's a virtual audience also that could be accommodated in this process. And then one year later, guess who got invited to the party um, at A19 in Vegas, we were able to get a beautiful location, lots of wall space, was able to feature a lot of people and the president of AIA, uh, William Bates, even came over and made sure to say it loud. So it was super dope to see the change of no and like a yes. So don't, don't take a no for an answer. I also love speaking. I feel like you guys can see that about me now. Um, so I leveraged these requests for uh, lectures as an opportunity to also ask for a say aloud. So here I was invited to speak at the Architecture Exchange East Conference in front of 750 people. Um, super proud and nervous to do it. It was great. And we were able to celebrate and elevate um, an amazing group of people, um, women and diverse designers of Virginia also in November was Pennsylvania. Now, this was a really profound moment because someone said to me, Pascal, if the goal is to inspire the next generation, then what kids do you know are coming to the Center for Architecture, the United Nations, South by Southwest? Like you're really putting them in very highbrow, limited access spaces. So I had that conversation with that realization with the uh, NOMA PGH, which is the community that in invited me to do a Say Aloud Pennsylvania. And they took over. They, they picked a venue that allowed a gallery that was in the heart of the community that was open to everyone. Um, and then they programmed it like no other. We had panel discussions, keynote speaking, uh, networking events, youth days where they had kids do projects all day and present in front of their favorite architect. It was crazy. It was amazing. But I feel like this exhibition was really one of my first huge community outreach uh, exhibitions ever and showed the power of the success of it because it wasn't just about to us but to the greater community as well then also in november of 2019 november of 2019 was a rough month um, i was also invited by the community builders to do a say it loud illinois now the community builders actually hold and have a series of community centers throughout Illinois. And so these are the space that people would rent out for birthday parties, baptisms, you name it, whatever. So it was so amazing that, you know, they invited us to have this up for about three weeks. It was so well received by the community that they had to extend their hours of operation for it to be open. And the exhibition ended up staying up for five months, if you can believe it. Um, but after this comes down, the intent was for it to travel to all the other community spaces throughout Illinois to again, continue to elevate people. Unfortunately, when it was ready to come down, COVID came, so I'm not sure if it ever got to move, but we're still on it. And the photos in the middle, I just wanted to share because that was the community's 2020 MLK Day of Service, which they all voted to happen in this space so that they could be around the exhibition and the great work. Um, and then in January of this year was Say It Loud Georgia. This was my first School of Architecture exhibition. Um, and you'd be surprised how difficult it is to get an exhibition in the School of Architecture. Not sure why. Um, but what was amazing, the icing on the cake for this particular exhibition is that we were able to elevate William Stanley and his wife, Ivanu Love Stanley, who had designed and constructed part of the Georgia Tech campus. And it was super dope to be able to feature that project and them and have the students understand and get the, the sense of who the legends and heroes are of their campus. And then in February of this year, we had Say Aloud UK as our first international exhibition. So that was a tough sell because nobody kind of knew about me and they're like, who, what do you want me to submit? Mm, I don't really know you. So it was really amazing to get the support of David Ajay, uh, Elsie Wusu and Chantal Martin. Um, which was some amazing, great projects that were featured throughout the exhibition and really got embraced by the community. It also showcased to me that the issues that we're fighting here is actually very much a global issue that really is going to take a collective 
uh, brainstorming and consideration to help solve and address. So I was really grateful and proud of our collaborations with RIBA, also known as the Royal Institute of British Architects, as well as Black Females in Architecture, who are based in the, um, in the UK, and the Stephen Lawrence Architecture Foundation. So those were great partners in this project. And then March of this year, we had our Say It Loud Ohio. Now this is by far my largest exhibition. We had over 44 submissions, over 32 video testimonials of people speaking to their experiences. It was at the Caramu House Theater, which is the oldest African-American theater uh, in the country. Thought it was the Apollo. Apparently Apollo was whites only until like 1930s. Who knew? Nonetheless, super excited, beautiful space. And about two hours before the exhibition opened, the governor got on the call and said, wow, COVID's crazy, y'all. It's time to uh, quarantine. So we were only allowed to let the first 90 people in. And really, right after that, everything shut down and closed up. So nobody ever got to see this incredible exhibition. Not nobody, excuse me. The first 90 got to. But the vast audience that we really wanted to showcase this amazing talent of Ohio really couldn't because of safety reasons, obviously. Um, and so what's my aspirations here? How do I get more information about architecture and diverse architects in front of kids um, consistently? So one thing is Lego has an architecture kind of division, awesome sauce. Can we just make sure that some of the projects that they have are by women and people of color? That'd be dope. Um, I'm also seeing really great books, kids books that have messaging on elevating heroes. And so thinking of that and leveraging the content that we gather from our Say It Louds, uh, one of the Beyond the Built Environment initiatives is the Learn Out Loud children's pop-up books. So we actually have been working with an artist, uh, Lawrence Atoigui, also known as Naturel, to triangulate, create headshots and articulations of our, art our architects and designers and have pop-up pages of their projects and of their work and the words I can too. And so when the kids see that 3D text, it's for them to stretch that uh, affirmation that they can accomplish becoming an architect and designer and impact the built environment. So the namesake of this lecture is I was asked to stand. Why you ask? Well, while studying at School of Architecture at Pratt within my first, second week of school in an architecture history class, it was about like 60, 70 students or so. Teacher comes in, he's like, all right, you and you stand up. I stand up, another student stands up. He's like, okay, these two will never become architects because they're black and because they're women. And I was taken aback by the audacity of this teacher to say something when he didn't even know my name nor my capacity. I was also shocked that in this room full of 70 students, there was only two of us who fit that description. And then it also wasn't lost on me that my peers kind of just heard that term looked and kind of went back to it as fact. And understanding the gravity of the words of professors, that 90% of what you say we take as complete truth. And so, what was shocking in, a, in other ways is that I'm from Cambria Heights, Queens, which is pretty much Little Haiti, and my community was like 95% Haitian. I could speak English and Creole interchangeably no matter where I was. Um, and then in high school, I went to B. Mary Lewis Academy, which is an all-girls Catholic preparatory school. Again, I'm in an environment where I'm a woman and I'm celebrated for being a woman and told that I'm going to do amazing things because I'm a woman. And so to be at Pratt, my first diverse audience of classmates, and to be told that I couldn't for two things that was innately part of me um, was very confusing to me. Um, so I just kind of wanted to understand and kind of break down why did the teacher feel so compelled to say, to spit those things like they were facts. Um, and then as I share this story with people in my lectures, I often ask my audience to stand if they have ever been told that they can't because of their gender and or race. And although it might sound like a shocking story, some might hear it as a shocking story, but what I want to share in this photo is it doesn't just happen to me. And it's, it's, a, it's a statement that's happening both in an academic platform and in professional settings. Um, and we need to understand that that's a message that is still being perpetrated as part of the oppression and the lack of diversity that's happening in our profession. Um, so what is the demographics of the students? According to NAAB, 5% of students who apply to schools of architecture are African-American, um, and 5% get enrolled, and 3% graduate. So I want to know what happened to that 2%. Were you like, wow, you guys are way too fascinated with basswood and don't sleep enough, and this is not for me? And if so, cool, that makes sense. Or 
were you asked to stand? Were you told a thesis project rooted in hip hop was an irrelevant topic? Were you told to do a project in a black community and told to erase the culture and to just start fresh? There is many ways that you are told, you know, directly and indirectly that you don't belong. And I want to know what happened to those 2% because I think that's a really big key moment. The other thing that we've learned in that NAAB report is that 50% of African American students who graduate with a degree in architecture come out of seven HBCUs. Seven schools produce 50% of us into the profession. So if we're very serious about increasing diversity and being more inclusive, then part of that goes back to supporting HBCU schools of architecture and making sure that that pipeline gets um, supported as well as create opportunities of pairing it with firms that will give internships and job opportunities accordingly. What are the demographics of our professors? Well, 34% are licensed. That shocked me, by the way. 7.6% um, <laughs> are Hispanic, 2.5% are Black, 68% are men, and 32% are women. Now, I'm not saying um, you have to have a Black uh, professor to have an experience if you're Black, um, a great experience if you're a Black student. I'm not saying that. However, like all things, having diversity in the way that you are taught allows you to have a diverse kind of range of education that you're given, um, a sensitivity, cultural sensitivity that will be offered to you, just understanding the dynamics of just different ways of looking at things. So I think it's important to understand, but also to see that we're rare, right? We're not always going to be there. So how do I help kind of support that? One of the most amazing resources is the Directory of African American Architects, which was started by Bradford Grant and Dennis Mann. Their intention was to capture and gather the present day practicing licensed architects so they understood how much was part of their community, right? Um, and in January of this year, University of Cincinnati was like, yeah, we're done. We're going to just defund this page. Um, and so we had a lot of talks, a lot of conversations trying to save the directory um, and say this is an important, you know, key component for us to keep track of the uh, success of us trying to increase diversity in the profession. Um, because, you know, well before AIA and all these other agencies started asking your gender and or race, Dennis Mann and Bradford Grant had that, that foresight. So if you take away this resource, then how are we gonna know if all this mentoring and all this advocacy work and all this stuff is actually working? It was unsuccessful. So if you go to that page at the bottom, you will get a site can be reached message. However, NOMA being the amazing organization that they are and understanding the importance of what, uh, what this directory is, they took it over. So again, wonderful print screening moment. Um, Blackarchitects.us uh, is now where you can find all the practicing um, architects of color in uh, different states and actually you can select by state, which is pretty dope. And it tells you where we are in terms of our, our totals. So I think it's a really important understanding that we need to make sure that we find ways of accountability we find ways of keeping metrics and measuring our success and or our progress. The other component is I realized, you know, what I try to do is I try to lecture um, with universities and colleges as much as possible. I'm a very vocal person, but then I also thought, what if I created this Vimeo page where I gathered you know, lectures, um, testimonials, videos, such of, um, really amazing dynamic architects of color and put them on the NOMA national page as their historian, right? Um, and here we have 52 lectures, great content that's out there. The Smithsonian, the National Museum of African American History and Culture actually named this website as a powerful resource and hyperlinked to our videos. What? Um, and last year we had about 1,500 views. And like I just checked when I was creating this presentation. We're at 15,000 views. So if your school of architecture lecture series doesn't have people of color or you don't have teachers that are people of color, you can definitely go to the NOMA National Vimeo page and watch amazing content, get blown away by the work um, and, the, and the understanding of these amazing talents all over the, the US. Um, also, I went back to Pratt. Say, hey, Pratt, we're going to uh, fix what happened and we're going to address this. So we're going to have a young designers conference where we're going to invite both college and high school students to participate in learning about architecture, as well as have a design competition. Now, we were able to engage 58 students, 25 speakers, and I really wanted this design competition because we always love an excuse to design. And I paired high school kids with college kids. 
Now, I wanted to show and send that message to college kids that you don't need to be 99 years old, ready to retire before you're ready to give back. Every step in your career, you have the ability and the power to pull the next person back forward with you, right? So you are already in a position of mentoring and, and helping the next generation. I also want to give the high school kids access to relevant uh, ideas and, and conversations. I'm pretty sure they respect you all's idea of, of what school is like better than me, who's like a bazillion years out of graduating from it, right? So um, I think it was a really am amazing moment and a great way of kind of uh, coming full circle with my experience at Pratt. Uh, then I'm like, all right, we got you in school. Great, you graduate, we need to get you a job. So we also hosted a series of panel discussions with hiring HR people, recruiters, um, you know, just kind of who's in charge of hiring and just kind of have them talk about what do they look for in the emails? What do they look for in the resumes? What do they look for in the portfolios? And then we had mock interviews and portfolio reviews to, again, help make those connections and give you all the jewels that you need to help get you a job upon graduation. And then I thought a lot of my younger audiences is going to be on social media. So I'm leveraging social media for social change. So we launched the Beyond the Built IG page in uh, December 2018. And every week, a different diverse designer takes it over and talks about their journey, uh, where they grew up what interests them in architecture, their projects, their work, um, and they have to follow the same concept of the exhibition. So we have to see your face, we have to hear your voice, we have to feel your impact. Um, and we've been able to showcase some amazing people from all over the world. And I think it's important that seeing and reading their stories, you get to understand that there's many paths to impact in the built environment. There's really multiple ways of getting here and there's not just one strict way. So I think it's really important to just do that as well as flex their muscles of telling their stories and putting themselves out there. So as of today, we have 4,647 followers and 91 featured designers. So this is yet another print screen moment and or grab your cell phones and start following ASAP if you're not doing so already. Uh, and then I thought, okay, I've done 15 exhibitions. What am I gonna do with all this content that's just living on my hard drive? So I launched the Great Diverse Designers Library in April of 2019. And the idea is when you go into the library, you can actually click each name, you get to see where they're located, the name of their firm, you see their face and you see their work and you get to read our bios, what we do, what we're most proud achievement. And it, I think it's important because when you get February, you get these, artic these articles that are like the top 15 black architects to know and, and in March, top 12 women architects to know. Yeah, like where are these numbers coming from <laughs> and why? Um, and it's always just a cute headshot. So I love this library because it's both the headshot and our work and an understanding of who we are. So right now it's sequenced in two ways, alphabetical order and by location. We currently have 416 people featured and, and I'm really proud of it. And so if you are looking for content, if you are looking for references, if you're looking for precedence, this is an amazing um, tool and I highly recommend that you take a look. Um, and remember how I told you my heart was broken with Say It Loud Ohio? Well, during quarantine, I decided to convert all of my exhibitions into virtual exhibitions. So instead of just seeing photos of the past exhibitions, which is what I typically showed on those web pages, I now have the virtual gallery where you're able to see all those amazing faces, their names, and when you click on any of their thumbnails, it takes you to their profile in the Great Diverse Designers Library. And here on the right-hand side of your screen is all the different um, exhibitions that are now virtual on the website. So I highly recommend that you take a look um, and get familiar and enjoy. And so what's the goal here? The goal is to publish the Great Diverse Designers textbook um, that will be used in academia. So professors have a support of books that they can find contemporary practicing beautiful, amazing, talented people to share, upon, share with you all. And on the left side of your screen here is a map that represents all the countries and states that are now featured in our library. And, uh, you know, I really, I'm proud of it. It's great work. So I really can't wait to hear what you think of it. Our ancestors are our heroes and we are their legacy. So why are we not come becoming architects? Well, according to NAB, um, the path to licensure could take anywhere between 11 to 12 and a half years. For me, at the bottom there, it took me 13 years. 
Um, I did my five-year degree at Pratt. I got my one-year master's degree at Columbia. I knocked out my IDP in three years. It was awesome. I was very strategic about that. But boy, oh boy, those AREs, they, um, they were not my friend. It took me 14 tests before I passed the seven that was required. Um, and so in total, it took me 13 years to be, to be an architect. So if you are struggling with the exams, um, please don't feel hard or when you get to that point if you have an issue with the with the exams it's not a test that measures how great of an architect you are it's how great of a test taker you are and it's a business just hold on tight keep going because studies show those who become licensed are more likely to stay in the profession and not move to another type another profession when things get hard um and then what's the cost well, again, according to NAB, it can cost anywhere between $40,000 to $230,000 to become a license. I mean, yeah, to become an architect. For me, at the bottom, it's $67,000, which I thought was a lot. Um, but now I'm seeing students are graduating with six figures in debt. That is a 30-year repayment plan that I got going on there for me. And I, like I said, have a four-year-old son. And while he is starting college, I will still be paying back um, my student loans. So we are asking for a very long time commitment and we're asking for a very large financial investment from people to come into the profession. And then when we graduate, we're not ballers. We're usually coming out with about 48 to $51,000 uh, annual salary, depending on the, you know, the state you're in, as well as how great the economy is doing or not doing. Um, but other professor, professions that, have, that are comparable in terms of the length of education and cost of education come out making six figures, right? So the, the value add coming back is not very um, immediate. Um, and then I get this conversation and questions are like, oh, Pascal, how do we introduce architecture to people of color? And I'm like, uh, it's not that we need an introduction. It's just that we have a, rep a negative uh, relationship with architecture, right? When we deal with the construction, the debris, the detours, the noises, the rodents, the smells, um, ultimately, uh, when those projects are done, they're almost, they're, they're rarely for that community and actually become a signifier that they can no longer support and or afford to be in those communities anymore. And it's just more examples of where their culture and their existence is being erased from a place that they've called home. So understanding that is that we need to make sure as architects, the relationship uh, with us is to make architecture uh, productive and a positive force in communities, regardless of socioeconomic um, status and make sure that people want to be part of our profession because in a lot of ways, the built environment fails us, right? The gym is our stoop, you know, asphalt is our play yard and our streets. And so we need to understand what that means and fire hydrants is our, you know, water world, right? So just kind of seeing where we're failing and where we are failing as a profession to the greater community and how we can serve them better. <clears throat> so currently there are 115,000 architects in the United States. 2% um, are African-American, and as of right now, 493 are African-American women um, who are practicing. And I am the 315th living African-American woman in the architecture, architect in the United States. And I claim that because I understood at that moment when I was asked to stand, that I would never just be representing myself. I would always be representing my gender, my race. Um, and it's a weight that I carry, but I think it's important to know that, hey, yeah, there's not a lot of us, but we're here and we're doing really important work. Um, other ways is that I try to be visible to the community as much as possible. I participate in parades. Um, I try to shout out as much as I can and get people in the community even aware of us. Um, I protest and participate in protests, and that's with organizations that I'm part of. I think it's great to challenge organizations that we're members to say, hey, you can do better, you have the power to do better, and I want you and expect you to do better. I share my story, I tell you the numbers that I owe, like I have you know, full, full disclosure about who I am, and I try to represent the profession whenever I can. Um, I also make room for our experiences. Uh, those are kind of photos and the titles of those seminars that I push for during A18. I also, we also created a J Max Bond lecture series that's in collaboration with AIA New York, where we're able to create a lecture series around one of our key important um, advocate architects and making sure we select speakers that speak to his value and echo the work that he had been doing when he was alive. Um, I also protect our history. I, um, if articles go out that misrepresent 
are not accurate in terms of what the facts that they're talking about, I find the time to mark it up, create the graphics and let them know and hold them accountable to the, the lack of clarity there or lack of um, accuracy. But not just to kind of complain for the purposes of complaining, um, I then try to establish relationships with both these entities and create ways and relationships between that publication and our organizations to ensure that in the future that we would be providing them content. So I'm really happy to now have an MOU with NCARB where the historian seat of NOMA is um, responsible to provide content written by us about us, about our experiences, so that when they put things up in February and in March, that it's uh, something that is, is vetted and is accurate and it's great. Um, and then the long-term goal is to create a long, sustainable, um, direct relationship with media publications to make sure that we are everywhere. Um, not just when there's an intense kind of focus on us, but just all the time. Um, and so during Juneteenth of this year, I launched a few dismantling injustice initiatives. And one of them is Say It With Me or Say It With Media, I affectionately call it, um, where I'm asking publications to step up to stand behind their statements of solidarity. So I'm asking these publications to A, do an audit of their work and see how much of their content is featuring women and people of color, then track and maintain and increase that number by 5% annually until 15% is achieved. I want them to pledge to create more content where they list us as great, trying to holla at Google on that one. Uh, and if you don't use the G word, that's fine. Uh, however you describe other architects, I want you to say, use the same vernacular and the same energy when describing women and people of color. Um, I also want to include research and development of historical content. Now, a lot of what we're doing here with Say It Loud is capturing contemporary practicing um, designers right now, but there's also a lot of work that we've done in the past and I want these publications to leverage their resources to actually do that research and that um, fact checking and pull forward to the light some of the historical achievements of us as well. And then I want them to pledge to create content that teach about how architecture is used to facilitate oppression because there's a question of it, whether that's true or not and I want to make sure that we show and educate a grand audience about how that is happening. And so when we talk about diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice, we almost always equate it to the way we practice what it's like to be an architecture firm, right? But here I'm saying architecture specifically can be advocates as well. And to set that up, I wanna show you how it can harm. So here's some ways where architecture is used to oppress. Uh, one is Robert Moses. I don't know about y'all, but I was taught that Robert Moses was the most amazing person ever who designed Central Park and all of our public screen, screen space, and he really changed New York, which he did. What I didn't realize is that he really did not like Black people. <laughs> and when he was developing Jones Beach, he made sure that all the bridges on the southern state, the 20 bridges on the southern state, was below nine feet at its highest, so that buses that buses, which is the predominant way where African Americans were using to transport, wouldn't be able to get to the beach. So this is in a clear example how they used architecture specifically to oppress and to withhold access. Then there are moments about architecture that's about knowing your place, right? It's um, projects that have four doors. Um, and what that means is that there will be a development that is able to leverage um, in tax incentives, larger FARs to have affordable housing components in the building. And then the designer and the developer has a front door for those who pay market rent and a uh, back door for those who are affordable housing uh, tenants, which kind of sucks because your development wouldn't happen or wouldn't be what it is without the support and the perks that comes with housing, affordable housing tenants, but yet you give them like the back door entrance. To me is the equivalent of whites only you know, colored only spaces. And I want to just make sure that we make that uh, connection as we enter the workforce and we are asked to design and draw certain things that you need to be able to advocate against that. As well as gentrification, redlining, there's many, many, many ways where architecture is being used to oppress. I just wanted to give you a few examples there. So how can they do things differently? All right, well, one of the examples is the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. This is one of my favorite projects. It is affectionately called the Lynching Museum. And this project got a lot of heat. Many people felt disturbed and uncomfortable with showing or having a building that speaks to such a dark past. Now, a few things. One, it's not the past. It's very much the present. And um, lynching happens every day. George Floyd was lynched 
um, hangings specifically are still happening. So if you are disturbed by pieces of metal hanging from the ceiling that are inscribed with names and dates and locations of those who have been hung, then I need you to bring that same energy when black bodies are swinging from the trees. You're saying, Pascal, girl, you being dramatic. Well, in 2017, an eight-year-old boy was hung in front of his 11-year-old sister by some high school students who thought it would be fun to hang him. And the girl was able to get help in time and save his life. Um, and there's pictures of the rope burns around his neck. But the most infuriating part of that is that the local law enforcement said those were good kids who just was joking and didn't have any malice. And so therefore no charges were brought to them, right? The second part of all of this is that a lot of textbooks are being rewritten to remove the word slavery. It is being replaced with the word uh, unpaid laborer. And photos of slavery is um, a picture of Black people dressed really nicely, having picnics in the field. Not kidding. So we need to understand that textbooks are being rewritten. And we need architecture to hold that role of keeping history. Because even if history makes you uncomfortable, Imagine people who were killed by it, right? Killed in these moments. And we need to recognize, hold that truth so that we can continue and make sure that generations, future generations do not repeat, technically current generations, do not repeat this terrible history uh, and make it a present day experience. Um, the National Museum for African American History and Culture, uh, it dates back for the first time someone requested this museum back to 1915. It took over a hundred years for this project to come to fruition. A hundred years. And every time it was asked, the response was African Americans haven't done any significant contributions that would warrant a museum. So this museum, aside from the fact that it was an incredibly diverse design and construction team, but it's also a building that keeps our elements sacred and showcases that we have done meaningful contributions to the world, right? Um, but this is also now where we're sending our artifacts, our clippings, our uh, important models or whatever. This is where we're sending how our community has impacted the world and now there's a safe space. So this project on so many levels is, is advocating architecture. Then you have the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, which is out in Atlanta, one of my favorite projects also done by Phil Freelon. And I want to speak about this project just a little bit. So when it's safe again, and I need you to go back to go to Atlanta and go to the space specifically, I need you to visit this exhibition here that I'm circling with my mouse. This is the kind of uh, counter protest exhibition where you sit and you put your hands on the countertop. There's a clock in front of you that counts down how long you're able to sit there. You put the headphones on, which you get to hear really hateful, terrible, um, messages about you, you don't belong here, you're a monkey, you're a dog, you're too dirty, you stink, um, you hear dishes being thrown, uh, glass breaking all around you, and then the stool shakes underneath you like you're getting kicked and shoved and moved around. I totally thought I could hang for like a long time, man, the, so many tears came out of my eyes immediately, and I thought how powerful is it that architecture and exhibition work has the power to translate an experience that I had one mini fraction of an iota of the inkling of what they actually went through and helped me understand the importance of what we're fighting for, the right to be in certain spaces, the right to, to be seen and protected equally. Um, and I think this is an amazing opportunity. A, the, the building is stunning, the work is stunning, that's within, but also this exhibition uh, is very powerful. Uh, J. Max Vaughn Jr. is an amazing architect, specifically also very much heavily in New York. And we're really proud to be part of the team that got uh, West 162nd Street renamed J. Max Vaughn Jr. Way. Um, and I'm hoping that as kids or people of the community see his name, they're like, oh, I wonder who he is. They're able to research him and see who his amazing contributions to the profession uh, in New York and globally. He's done work all over the world. And if you ever heard of Davis Brody Bond, He's the bond. Um, so that was super cool. And I'm just kind of putting, planting ideas of kind of embedding our heroes into the built environment. It's another great way of, of doing things here. Uh, my very first project ever as an architect uh, um, intern is the African Bear Ground National Monument in New York. Uh, they were excavating for yet another federal building downtown Manhattan. And started coming across some remains and those were getting chucked and thrown out, of course, until it was whistle blue. 
and they were construction was halted. And Howard University came to the site and they um, researched it and found that there were remains of babies as small as eight months old to 60 year old people. Um, and we found over 800 remains on site. So when we created this um, monument, um, we actually inscribed on the side of the uh, ancestral chamber, the full map of downtown Manhattan and etched the full extents of the African burial ground to showcase that all of downtown Manhattan is literally uh, houses about 20,000 African slave remains. And figuratively, conceptually, physically, really, Ma downtown Manhattan is built on top of the bones and backs of black slaves. So all your city halls, all those spaces, all those buildings during their excavation found human remains and continue to build anyway, just saying. Anywho, this is an amazing project where this one lot that holds the history of what's happened there, about where we are, as well as creating an opportunity to provide information about the extent of how we impacted the world. And these mounds that you see in the landscape, that's actually the 800 uh, plus bodies reinterred on the site. So this is not where you go to skate, this is not where you go on a date, this is where you go to learn and keep sacred and, and learn about the history. Um, also, like I said previously, I'm Haitian and with the terrible earthquake of January of 2010, I actually lost a lot of family and wanted to truly give back. And at the time, I was also an ACE mentor. So it was really dope to be able to leverage both my capacity as a mentor and a designer to create a school campus to replace one that had uh, collapsed during the, the earthquake. Um, I also, at my time at FX Collaborative, I worked on 888 Boylston, which is the highest performing speculative office building in all of New England. We pushed for lead platinum and all sustainable strategies all over. So this is a great example of a project that strives for environmental justice, right? So architecture can fight for justice in different methods and ways. And then Bronx Point, which is my project here at S9, one of my projects here at S9 that I love. Um, it is a 542 affordable housing project with the first brick and mortar hip hop museum plus community facilities at the ground floor um, and retail and and waterfront access parkland uh, plazas so it's really a project that's designed and built for the community that embeds the culture within so even though we have the hip hop uh, museum we want to make sure that we had the whole concept of the project be hip hop. And so we started to talk about the cultural significance of the materials that were picked, the colors of the brick, as well as the movement of the uh, rhythm of the fenestrations, the windows to show that uh, embedding that pattern of, of life into the building. So when you look at this project, you don't go, oh man, that's, that's public housing. You will look at that project and say, wow, that's pride, that's joy. And everyone deserves a great high quality, a uh, place to call home, irregardless of how much money they make. And so this is a really amazing project that had great community engagement that I'm hella proud of. Um, and what I want to continue to aspire to do is replacing oppressive monuments with those of great leaders and community spaces. Um, this people used to kind of laugh at before, but now it's getting some play. Um, people are starting to understand that some of these monuments and people that are put at the highest peak of communities were slave owners and people who fought to keep slavery thriving. Um, and so having them be put in those positions of places to be revered um, really was a counter narrative to really telling the full truth of who that person was. And also a dog whistle to make sure that we knew that our freedom was limited and we should just be grateful, right? So I really want you to consider what are your public spaces and if there's a monument that needs to come down, what else can be put in its place? And then architects as activists. So it's great that we do work, we design, and we, we change the built environment, but also how we change the profession, how we engage with our communities. So here are some amazing people and great examples of ways of getting involved. So Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation, if you're not familiar with Beverly Willis, she's an amazing architect who actually was disturbed by the lack of women in partner and principal levels at firms. So when she retired, she asked her past developer clients who was already a diverse group of people to commit to not hiring any architecture firms that did not have women in leadership positions. And also in these firms, I was used to getting repeat work, stop getting work, and they were told why. So they found the women in their office and uh, pulled them forward and elevated them and got them to a place of partner and principal. But you can't just elevate us and put us in a chair. No, you have to like mentor us and actually make us ready for that position 
because being a partner in principle has equity and uh, you know ownership implications. So it was really powerful to see um, her work and how she leveraged this idea that when you want the profession to change, sometimes asking us to change isn't enough, that getting to our clients is actually a, a very effective way of pushing change within us. Um, again, you have the National Organization of Minority Architects, uh, NOMA, which um, has to next year will be our 50th anniversary of constantly advocating and fighting for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We have chapters all over, um, all over the, 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 um, the US. There's a wonderful Be More, my favorite name, Be More Noma chapter. So, um, you know, there's, there's many uh, chapters and organizations that I want you to try to engage and take part in, especially now that a lot of the things are global and virtual you're able to kind of connect and be part of there while being safe within your home. Um, then the NOMA org programs, I was talking about Project Pipeline when we first started our conversation together. Here's some uh, imagery and footage of past Project Pipeline events where you're seeing the amount of reach and the amount of kids that we're actually able to connect with. And now some of those same little kids are now coming back as mentors, as architects who are practicing. So it's a really great feeling and something that you could definitely be a part of as they have many virtual uh, project pipeline camps. Then you have Tiffany Brown, whose organization is called 400 Forward out in Detroit, Michigan. She is amazing. Uh, she thought to herself, instead of worrying about trying to connect with a thousand people once, I'm going to try to focus in on six girls a year, I believe. Um, and what she does is she mentors them. She takes them to lectures, job sites, construction sites, newly constructed projects, wood shops, you name it. Um, teach them about computers, write their recommendation letters, really support them and really give them a true consistent presence in their life and a true introduction to the profession. And if they choose not to do it, that's fine, but at least they will really give a, a, a hearty effort to get you there. So I think she's super dope. Tiffany Brown. Uh, you have Brian Lee. Uh, he's out in Louisiana, New Orleans. Uh, his movement is called Design Justice uh, and Design as Protest, where he actually engages communities and just says, hey, what are the things that are keeping you up at night? How can we help you? And then not just architecture, but just what are the issues? And then maybe there's ways that architecture can solve it, but also we are problem solvers. We are critical thinkers, so we can help brainstorm and how we can help solve some of those community issues. He has twice a week virtual uh, meetings where he's having volunteers do amazing things all over the country. So if you're interested, I highly recommend that you do a DAP, uh, participate in DAP and, and support that mission as well. And then you have Mike Ford with the Hip Hop Architecture Camp. Um, I'm, gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit at length about this because I think it's so dope. So first thing he does is he gives these kids Legos, right? Kids come in, they build stuff and he's like, okay, just design whatever you want, build what you want with the Legos. After that, he'll say, okay, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Most times the kids didn't really have a solid answer. Then he hands out lyrics of music, hip hop or rap music that speaks about architecture to some capacity. And he has them color code the lyrics by rhythm, um, by rhyme scheme, just ways of decoding and kind of finding the layers of content in the lyrics. And so you will hold up a Lauren Hill lyric next to an Eminem lyric and you can see that they're very different in terms of the way that they're made up, right? Um, and then you, you take that information and then you go into Tinkercad and they would extrude and create a cities based off of their analysis about the music. So first thing he does there is really talk about conceptual thinking. He also gives them another layer of understanding of something that they already love. So that's dope right there. But then there's more. He actually has the kids create a song that speaks to how they're going to use architecture to solve their community's issues. So you'll have amazing conversations with these kids. And for the Bronx uh, hip hop architecture camp that I was able to participate in, these kids rapped about how they're going to use architecture to solve teen pregnancy and, and drug addiction. And so I highly recommend uh, going on his website, listening to some of the songs that those kids have come up with. They're really amazing. Um, and it's just phenomenal. And he has been probably the most successful out of all of us in terms of reaching beyond the profession. And he's been on Oprah, he's been on Rolling Stone, he's like everywhere. So, and he's also having hip hop architecture camps virtually. So if you're interested and think this is something that aligns with your values and excitement, I highly recommend that you reach out. And then beyond the built environment, we're actually creating a um, See It Loud augmented reality app and camp. 
Um, I'm working with an app developer out in Poland uh, called Numtech. And the idea is, again, leveraging the information that we get from the Say Aloud exhibitions, the projects that are actually built, that you would have like almost like a Pokemon Go, if you will, where in the map it will tell you where are some projects near you that are designed by women and diverse designers. And when you click on it, you'll see their faces, right? So you see Phil Freelon, David Ajay, and J. Max Bond. Um, and then you're creating, you can create art and designs that are inspired by what you see, capture it on your mobile device and see it predicted on the building at one-to-one -one scale, um, which is again, giving people the audacity to reimagine their city in context, right? It's creating more and more architects and designers. Um, so the Beyond the Built Environment uh, main initiatives is the See It Loud Augmented Reality app and camp, which is uh, really focused for preteens and teens, most likely they're able to have the um, app or technology to create to work with the app. The Say It Loud exhibitions, which is for professionals and students. Stopping here for emphasis, y'all. You guys should be submitting to these. And a Learn Out Loud um, children's pop-up book, which again is focused more towards small kids and children. So we're really trying to have programming and initiatives that support the full pipeline of, of being part of the profession. So the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in the moment of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at the time of challenge and controversy. Back in the day, I was asked to stand and I've been standing ever since, I'm standing for what's right. I've been standing for a really more just, equitable, diverse and inclusive profession. I really hope that you are inspired to stand with me. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. And in, in lieu of the concrete um, great space that we usually sit in, the echoing of the absent applause we'll just have to do for now. Um, thank you very much. That was inspirational. Um, and now we have time for questions um, for Pascal. So um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. You can raise your blue hand. Um, if someone else is talking, otherwise, um, would anyone just like to jump in and unmute? I'm going to jump in really quick. It was worth the wait, Pascal. This, this, I'm really happy to see the transition of the project in Ohio go online. I think that probably is 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 incredibly important for the cause. But I can't I can't get over what immense energy and optimism you have. And I just really hope that that rubs off on all of us. You're just really spectacular and keep up the really tremendous good work. Thank you so much. That was really, I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. I'm really honored for the opportunity to even share my, my journey and my story. And uh, I really wanna hear from you all. Um, I wanna hear your voices. I wanna hear your questions. Please, don't be shy. Maybe I'll start with one question, building on um, Brian's comments. Um, we have a lot of very entrepreneurial, energetic, engaged students. Um, and so, and faculty, I mean, and staff, everyone is sort of um, brimming with ideas. Uh, and I think the biggest obstacle, of course, always is execution and buy-in. Um, so how did you, or how have you approached kind of taking your dreams and your vision from ideas and plans into the real, um, the real virtual environment, the real built environment um, to, help, to help all of us understand how um, on top of school and work and um, life, you are able to create all these things as well. Sure, I think it's the having the audacity to ask, right? Like, I, I mean, I talked about the no that I got from AIA, but there's been a lot of yeses that I was like, oh, that's all right, okay. Um, and been, been proactive about it. If I got a yes, then I followed up. I didn't sleep on it. I didn't sleep on opportunities. I leveraged my network as much as I can or could, and then really tried to engage as much as possible. The other thing is kind of like what I did with this presentation. I talk about what I'm trying to do. Um, there's this false understanding that you need to be well accomplished and done when you start sharing all the hard work. No, you share with your community what you're trying to do. And if people, if it resonates with people, if people want to get involved, they can support you in that mission. To that point, I gave this, this lecture and 
I got an email saying, hey, I was in your lecture and I heard you're wanting to publish textbook. We're a publication. We want to publish the Great Diverse Designers textbook. I was like, oh my God, right? So I wouldn't have been able to make that connection without sharing what my aspirations were for that. So I think part of it is A, having the audacity to ask, you know, just ask what you're trying to do. Um, don't pause, like just keep going after it and then ask for help. No one says you have to do it alone. Like you can ask for help. Help is wanted and needed. Um, and it's, it's really critical. So I would say those are, you know, if you have an idea, have conversations. Um, people were kind of saying, Pascal, aren't you worried someone's going to steal your idea? I was like, I just want the thing to happen. Whether it's mine or not, fine, whatever. If somebody develops an app so that I don't have to pay a few hundred thousand dollars to make develop, sure. As long as it's happening, right? That's the goal. So um, I think it's, we need to stop being so scared to share um, what we're working on and ask for help. And I think it's very important, Pascal, that the notion of developing this infrastructure that supports and communicates uh, uh, communicates information about the great achievement of Black architects. You know, we've been having a discussion internally about reforming the way that we teach architecture and being more inclusive. And you know, the other day uh, we happened to be very good friends at school with Michael Marshall, a local DC mm -hmm. architect who was featured in your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I realized I couldn't find a single image of Michael Marshall's new District of Columbia uh, Student Center. It's, it's a block up the street from where I live here in DC. So I reached out to Michael and I said, I really need this because I, I want to talk about this in one of my introductory classes. And we've been having this discussion internally about how difficult it is. You know, you want something from Richard Meyer or you want something from Zaha, you can get it immediately on, on the web. But if you want something that is equally an, an important and interesting building by an African-American architect it is a real slog. And I think the idea of developing this network, uh, this infrastructure is gonna make it possible for us to be able to, and we, we've even talked about internally of sharing this information internally so that we can make ourselves better faculty members so that we can teach more broadly about our constituency, our fellow, our fellow humans who are, are great architects. So keep up the work on that. Well, I think what's great is that every time we do a say it loud, we are giving and pouring more content into the library. And that library is ready right now, right? So I just put it on the chat, everyone, um, the hyperlink to the library and to my um, different ways of following me to stay connected. I'm seeing people kind of leave, so I'm putting it out there. But it's, it's ready for you right now, and it'll constantly be growing. And uh, when you sort by location, I, I think Marilyn has maybe one person who submitted. So. I need you all to actually find and cultivate within yourselves like courage to submit um, and to be featured. And also for you to say, hey, I was in Maryland, I didn't see your work, why are you not there? And really get on people about submitting themselves to be featured and to be part of that content. And that's also leveraging that relationship with the media, right? With the Say It With Media um, uh, initiative, where now I'm getting publications who are committing to, to, to elevating us and their biggest fear is like pascal we're scared to make this commitment and then we can't find the content i'm like don't you worry we have the say it loud li you know we have this library so so that has really helped that fear about making that those commitments so i think to your point it can't just be about us putting ourselves out there but it also needs to be people who's pulling for that information as well to create that want now, now just just one interruption though <laughs> i'm looking at this site it's fantastic but you need to change how you've put Washington DC in there because we are going to be the 51st state. And if you put us in as Washington DC, that is, that's, that's treating us like we're some kind of, of, of territory. Put us in as the District of Columbia because that's who we'll be. Okay, got it. I will be state. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was an oversight at first, but no, this is, well, this is exactly what we're looking for. So this is, thank you. Of course. So oh, um, I will read one question from the chat for you, Pascal. Um, and it sort of builds on, I think, the question we had before. Um, and this is from Carlos Vazquez. And he says, first, let me say your work is very inspiring. As a student of color growing up in a predominantly white neighborhood, I have also been asked to stand so your words resonate with me personally. The School of Architecture was my first exposure to architecture professionals that look like me and that's where I find inspiration. Where does your drive and inspiration come from for your work? And do you have any advice for us moving forward? 
Ooh, um, I think a lot of my advocacy work is um, rooted in what I want to see for the profession. And that also helps me kind of determine what uh, initiatives or, or efforts that I'd be a part of or kind of invest my life into, right? Um, but I think the inspiration is just seeking change. I don't want what happened to me to happen to people and it's, and it's happening, right? Um, and I'm trying to be proactive about that, saying that, okay, well, here's my contributions to try to make those changes. Um, and again, it, I think it's just critical that having diversity or representing multiple kind of women and, and, and just BIPOC designers is not just for the benefit of those girls and BIPOC students. Like everyone is going to be enlivened and understood and glean value and, and uh, design ac access to some of these great tools that these designers are using. I think it's just, it's gonna help everyone. Um, so I guess I'm fueled by told that I, that I can't do something and fueled that be fueled by no's, but ultimately it's all rooted in trying to just correct something that happened to me. I guess that's really <laughs> self-reflective, yeah. but I guess truly that's yeah. where I want. I just want a better future. Yeah, that's really important. Hi, I wanted to um, first say thank you so much for this lecture. Like no words can explain how great this was. Um, and as a person who, um, who has really fought for um, a more diverse history taught within the School of Architecture. Um, I think that your database is gonna be super helpful. I've tried looking up um, professionals that look like us and um, it's kind of hard to, to like, go through all that information without getting a bunch of repeats. So I just wanted to say thank you so much and that your work is not <laughs> done without any merit. Like, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much for your comment. And again, have fun in there. I also kind of realized that a lot of our education about like architects was so Western focused. I was like, man, there has to be people from all over. So getting projects from like Dubai and, and South Africa has been like incredible. It's like, wow, I have never seen this before. And it kind of went back to what Google said. They're like, Pascal, there's just not enough content about you. So even us researching wouldn't matter because the content's actually not there. So many people who submit for Say It Loud say it was the first time they submitted for anything. And then you're looking at the work on the website. It's phenomenal work. And so I'm like, guys, if you can do this for Say It Loud, you should be submitting for awards. You should be submitting for grants, fellowships, publications. Publications are not just going to knock on your door and say, hey, want to feature you. You have to submit photographs professionally taken. You need to submit the information. You need to put yourself out there. So really, this is a huge exercise in getting our community to just, just kind of disassociate this idea of elevating yourself as being arrogant or boastful, right? It's like, if you don't celebrate you, then who's going to celebrate you? Who's going to know about your win if you don't tell people? Um, so I, I appreciate that you, you like the, the library, please peruse, take a look. And again, let me know if there's people who are missing. I will, I'll try my best. Any other questions in the chat or anyone else want to unmute and share? Please. Lindsay, I'm just going to piggyback on, on, um, Amori's comment and say that we're going to be putting out a call for the, the next um, uh, Spangler lecture. And uh, Pascal came here today because of people like Amori voting and uh, nominating uh, the, the presence of, of Pascal. So make sure that when that, that call comes out that you guys respond to it and, and we'll work our darndest to make sure that we get somebody that I don't know if we're gonna, we can get somebody to compare with Pascal in terms of energy, but we'll try. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find amazing, brilliant, uh, dynamic designers who are changing the profession. But yes, you know, you, know, you know, you have leadership at your school who's asking for your input. You know, don't sleep on that, give it, you know, um, and, and push for more things. Like if you guys wanna do a petition for Say It Loud Maryland um, at the school, we can do that too. So, you know, really, this just keeps thriving and striving for it. And I think doing that and having, you know, in the school for you all to see greatness of amazing practicing contemporary designers of 
of Maryland would be great to see. And I've been focusing on contemporary because I wanted to also decouple this idea of greatness being people who are been gone and you know you can't reach. I love this idea of you walking into a gallery, seeing work and be like, ooh, I'm gonna follow this person. I'm gonna check their website. I'm gonna look for articles about them. I'm gonna go visit their firm one day. I can, so that we feel more attainable and not so far and distant in the moment. So I think really celebrating some dynamic and powerful um, designers interiors, landscape, urban planners, you know, any, anyone and how they impact the built environment is also really important. So let me know when you guys are ready to get started with that as well. Any other questions, observations? Please. Um, you seem like a very energetic person. Um, this is Kareem McLegan. I, I I'm just amazed by how much work you are putting in um, and still be so energetic. Like, I, as a, as a, I don't know if it's different as a college student right now in pursuit of my BSc. It's like there are so many sleepless nights and we've not even accomplished half of what you've done. How do you get through a day? Um, what is a, a process of, of getting from one project to the other look like? Do you sleep? Is that something you consider? <laughs> Oh, that's a that's a great question, and I, I appreciate it. Um, I want to say about a year ago, an, an article or a reporter asked me the same question. I was like, oh, I get like three to four hours of sleep a, a night. Oh my God, I got so many phone calls and people yelling at me like, Pascal, you can't do that. That's not sustainable. Like this will be really bad for you um, in the long term, right? Um, so I kind of had to start practicing what I was preaching, which is ask for help. Right. Um, so that's part one. Two, I just kind of try to take bite sized pieces of initiative that I think can work and then see where it took me. Honestly, I went to a built by women exhibition at the Center for Architecture and saw all these projects on the wall done by women. I went up to the, the executive director and was like, hey, can we do it on the you know, African Americans? He was like, sure. I was like, oh, okay. Right. And I just kind of did my say it loud in New York. I thought that's where I was gonna stop until the UN invited me to do it there. And then it kind of took off. And I just kind of, I think part of what I'm saying is put your intentions out there, take your first step. And then you literally have no idea where that first step is going to ultimately take you. Um, and so that's one. Two, I try to be very disciplined and organized in the work that I do and how I do it. Um, in terms of emails, correspondence, and how I keep track of things. And I think that organization has lended itself well for me to kind of feel like I'm multiplying and do a lot more than I'm actually, uh, that's actually human or able to do. Um, and then I also try not to separate myself um, in terms of uh, advocacy, parent, spouse, and architect. So a lot of those circles of who I am overlap. And so conferences, my husband and my kid comes with me. My kid has been to more board meetings than probably me at this point, right? Like, you know, it's very much there. Um, I do advocacy while I'm at work, right? So there's an overlap that takes place um, that I try not to divide myself, but just kind of say, how can these two parts of my identities colliding? What does that look like? Um, but yes, I definitely am I'm, I'm being better about making sure I sleep. I'm a big component. I only drink water. That's another thing of part of who I am. I just think I, I have a lot of energy uh, in general. Um, and my husband thinks I'm crazy because he said I wake up and I'm like, okay, let's start our day. I'm going to need to calm down. So um, that's just kind of uh, um, part of who I am. And I guess one of the um, tools that I have at my disposal that I am very you know grateful for but so thank you so much thank you i just took notes so first step um you know take the first step very organized take bite-sized workload and get family involvement yep, i'm going to run with those for now yes thank you that will help thank me you. significantly thank, thank you. you no problem all right great so maybe we can um wrap up with our yeah. last question in the chat and i'll read it again um, for you, Pascal, any advice for new young professionals to push this type of work in their firms, which may be lagging behind on addressing systematic racism and or representation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say have conversations, build a committee, right? See, the, see if it's an appetite for a committee, because again, you shouldn't be able to, shouldn't have to do it alone, um, and create a cohort of people who are like-minded, who find value in that kind of work participate, a volunteer, get familiar with other organizations because then you'll really get a pulse of what's happening, who are the characters or the policies that are in the way of justice and what we can do to start dismantling it. 
Um, I think those are the like, really big critical things. And then also understand that there are a lot of firms out there who uh, advocacy work is part of their business model. Um, so if making that request or that push is too hard, like just a little too hard than it really needs to be, then, you know, I would say look at other firms and at the work that they're doing, stuff like Mass Design Group, Colocate. Um, there's an amazing uh, firm called Concordia out in Louisiana, and they have something called a Community Fellow. So every project that they do, they actually hire, they pay someone of the community, like a leader in the community to come and attend all the design meetings. So it's not just like these community board meetings twice or whatever at night with some cold pizza, but it's actually saying the community, your voice and your expertise in the way we design this product that will impact your life is important. And it, it has value. So we're paying you and it creates this two way conduit of information, both from the design team into the community and back. Um, and so I thought that, I mean, I'm just saying that there's like so many different models of firms that are out there. They might not be in the press as much, but there's definitely a lot of people doing great work. And lastly, I would highly recommend participating in NOMA National Conference and AIA's grassroots conferences. Those typically are where I see the most advocate architects who are doing this kind of work for different things that kind of relate more to their communities. But you realize like, oh, I'm not by myself in this. Like there are people doing this work. Um, they're just not often celebrated and elevated, honestly. So yeah, I think um, try, create a community, create a, a committee in your office, speak to leadership. And honestly, if, if it's too much work, then join membership organizations and put that work there and um, look for firms that you think really do align with your value. So, that yeah. answer reminds me of the Beverly Willis strategy of um, if you can't change your firm, go to the clients. But also if you can't change your firm, go to like the workforce and the people that make that office work and change it from the inside out. Um, I know a few architects who are now developers so that instead of being the group that responds to an RFP and reads it, do it, they're the ones actually who are writing the RFPs and then making sure that they're being seen and have access to women owned firms and c uh, color uh, BIPOC firm ownership, right? So. They're like, you know what, I want to change the built environment and I'm just tired of looking at these RFIs that, or RFPs, excuse me, that don't really address the issue and are taking that position and bec becoming the client, which is also really powerful, a very powerful position to, to take as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much again, Pascal. This was really energizing and inspiring. Um, and we'll have to have you back for all sorts of things in the future. Um, and I'm fine if anyone wants to stick around and chat, um, talk about the next Spangler lecture um, or whatever it is, I'll be here um, for a little bit. So thank you again, virtual round of applause, silence round of applause for Pascal. Thank you very much everyone for attending too. Thank you so much. And again, I put my contact info and links in the chat. So please uh, copy and participate and follow Beyond the Bill and help us get a Say It Loud Maryland going. Thank you. Bye. Also, this moment is very interesting because the people that don't Sign off are the ones that may be left. Brian, Lindsay, thanks, thanks so much. She was great. And I'm um, sorry she left because I actually would like to talk to her, but I will uh, reach out to her um, privately. Um, she was really good. And yeah. I, uh, I had uh, sent an email to her, I responded to Brian in a private chat that I think she'd be excellent to have back in the school um, yeah. when, when we can in person. You know, just there's a true energy about her that um, is infectious. Yes, indeed. My goodness, <laughs> who, who knew that? It was, I mean, the conversations on the phone, I had a kind of inkling that might be something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. No, yeah. She was fantastic. And I was hoping she would stay around too. I didn't want to strong arm her or make her feel obligated. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, right. I thought she was going was to. Fun. And then, because uh, I invited Craig to say hi, but wait, yeah. wait, no, we can do that some other way. Yeah. So.
Yeah, I um, I definitely want to reach out to her. In fact, we have a committee that we formed here as a result of BLM, and um, I think it would be actually excellent. I'm going to have ask her if she would participate with our group in meeting at some juncture because um, I think uh, she would really offer a lot to uh, some of the things we're trying to uh, progress here. Great. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. I, you know, I, 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 I do miss being able to go out to dinner afterwards because that's.